Also in 1862, Congress will pass the Homestead Act. It offers 160 acres of land in the Great Plains free to any citizen that was ahead of a household. The only catch here is that citizens had to farm it for five years. They couldn't just sell the land. It's important to remember that they were talking about citizens. So even if immigrants wanted to do it, they had to become a citizen first. With the Morrill Act of 1862 and 1890, Congress gave free land to states to create agricultural colleges. This was done because farmers needed to learn the latest techniques and inventions to have a more productive farm. On the slide, you can see some examples of universities that started out as agricultural colleges in the 1800s. One of them is very close to home, Texas A&M University. You also had other schools like LSU, Nebraska, Oklahoma State, Michigan State, and Auburn. Next, we're gonna talk about farming technology. How can farmers keep cattle drives from ruining their crops? Many farmers began to build barbed wire fences around their property to prevent cattle drives from ruining their crops. As farmers started to settle the West, new inventions made it easier for them to cultivate the land. Originally, farmers used wooden plows to prepare the land for planting seeds. The soil in the Great Plains was much harder to plow, so a stronger material was needed. The steel plow made it easier to cut up the dry land for planting. Remember that the Great Plains were seeing significantly less rainfall than the eastern United States. To irrigate crops, farmers needed to tap into the underground water supplies. The invention of the steel windmill allowed farmers to irrigate their land by pumping the water out of the ground. Finally, the reaper allowed farmers to harvest their crops quicker, easier, and more efficiently. When homesteaders failed to produce enough crops on their 160 acres of land, they lost it. This led to huge corporate-owned farms known as bonanza farms, who could farm the land more efficiently. Let's look at the impact of the Homestead Act. As more and more Americans moved out west, you also saw the growth of towns and cities, major cities like Denver. Obviously, there were more farms established because people were claiming 160 acres of land. But as they're moving west, we also found new resources like gold, silver, coal, timber, and oil. All of this led to a general increase in the amount of jobs available for Americans who wanted to move out west. There was one more obstacle that Americans had to face as they tried to settle the American frontier, the Plains Indians. Remember that many Indian tribes had been relocated to Oklahoma before the Civil War. Think Trail of Tears. From 1860 to 1890, Americans began to move the Plains Indians off their land. Number one, if precious metals were found, that land was lost to them. Not to mention that prospectors would also cross through their lands to get to the mountains where the gold was. Number two, many of the trains that were built cut right through their lands with little regard for, what, for the Indians. Number three, in order to get the Indians to move, Americans slaughtered the American buffalo by the hundreds as they drove the trains through the plains. Plains Indians' lives were dependent on the buffalo for survival. They hunted the buffalo. They used every part of the buffalo. They ate the meat. They used the hide for clothes and for shelter. They used their horns for weapons. This probably did more than anything to defeat the Plains Indians. But most importantly was the failure of the reservation system. Most of the Native Americans that lived in the western part of the United States were moved onto reservations. The U.S. government promised many tribes that they would get food and supplies to help them survive on this piece of land. Unfortunately, this piece of land was usually the worst land available, and the U.S. government failed to keep up their end of the promise. Native American boarding schools were established in the U.S. during the late 1800s with the goal of assimilating Native American children and youth into mainstream American culture, while at the same time providing a basic American education. These boarding schools were first established by various Christian missionaries who often started schools on reservations, especially in the lightly populated areas of the West. The government paid religious groups to provide basic education to Native American children on reservations. Children were typically immersed in the American culture through forced changes that removed elements of their native culture. They were forced to cut their, their hair short, forbidden to speak their language, and had their real names replaced by European names to both civilize and Christianize them. They even wore military-style uniforms. 
The experience of the schools were usually harsh and sometimes deadly, especially for the younger children who were forcibly separated from their families. It would take the Indian Wars to finally conquer the Plains Indians. The fearless warrior Red Cloud was one of the greatest military leaders in Native American history. Despite possessing limited men and resources, he harassed white troops and settlers along the Bozeman Trail. He was very successful in getting the Americans to stop traveling the Bozeman Trail. He was one of the few Amer Native American leaders to win a war against the United States and dictate the terms of the peace. The Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, was an armed engagement between the combined forces of the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho against the United States Army, led by General George Custer. It occurred near the Little Bighorn River in eastern Montana. It was an overwhelming victory for the American Indians. The 7th Cavalry, a force of 700 men, was severely defeated. Five of the companies were annihilated. Custer, his two brothers, a nephew and brother-in-law were all killed. U.S. deaths were about 268 and 55 were wounded. Of course, when this news hit the newspaper, even though Custer attacked an innocent group of Native Americans, of course, Custer was seen as the hero. With only a handful of warriors, Chief Joseph and then Nez Perce conducted one of the most epic retreats in military history. Traveling over 1,700 miles in terrain, they evaded 10 different groups of American U.S. Army troops and beat them in 18 different fights, only to finally give up a few miles from the Canadian border. The Lakota Indians thought that the ghost dance would also make them bulletproof. This would lead to the Wounded Knee Massacre, where 300 armed Native Americans were slaughtered by the U.S. 7th Cavalry. The Wounded Knee Massacre officially ends the Indian Wars in 1890. With the ending of the Indian Wars, the government tried a different tactic. In 1887, the government started to try to Americanize Native Americans. We call this policy assimilation. It made it official when Congress passed the Dawes Act in 1887. The Dawes Act gave Native Americans 160 acres of land to farm. They split up the reservation into 160 acre plots. If the Native Americans were not able to farm the land, that land was sold off to whites. The law also required them to abandon their tribal loyalty and send their kids to boarding schools that I mentioned in an earlier slide. On April 22, 1889, the federal government decided to open up unassigned lands of Indian territory in western Oklahoma to white settlement. Hundreds of thousands of prospective settlers couldn't wait for the day to get there, so they took off a day early to claim those lands. That's why we call people from Oklahoma Sooners, because they got there sooner than anyone else. This is also the mascot of the University of Oklahoma uh, and their football team. Also, the Homestead Act brought African Americans out of the South and into Kansas as they reclaimed land for themselves. We call those people Exodusters. Exodus means to leave. This ends this video on the last West. Go ahead and proceed to the next assignment.